Good morning. Appreciate our team uh, singing that old school Victory in Jesus song. I sent Robbie a text earlier this week. I said, hey, can we sing this song? And he's like, I don't know it, but we'll try it. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? Some of you just got dated real quick, right? Because you knew that song very well. You grew up with it. Uh, anyway, we're grateful that you're here today. We're excited about the story project, which we're in. This is chapter 27. So uh, if you don't have a story Bible, there's uh, one or two left on the table as you exit to the right. Just pick one of those up. Uh, reading the Bible, chronological order to help you grasp the big picture, the big story of God, the upper story we call it. And in doing so, you'll find your lower story connected to, to God's uh, redemption of mankind. Because there are stories in Scripture that connect with us for sure. Uh, we, are, we are in this chapter called the resurrection. It's an exciting exciting chapter uh, because the resurrection of Jesus is an amazing thing. This past week, uh, we lost a real prince uh, of uh, Christendom, uh, a real saint. Uh, Frank Fuller passed away, and uh, he had a 50-plus uh, year ministry at Oak Grove Christian Church. He was involved in the school systems and uh, as a counselor and as a helper there, uh, uh, instrumental in starting the uh, Pennsylvania County Food Bank and uh, helping people find food and get food throughout our county and region. Um, and he did all these great and wonderful things, but he died. Death comes to all of us. And so um, we have these expressions in our culture. There are two things for certain. Death and... Tax. Right. And tax day is something you can't avoid because it comes around every quarter or maybe in April for you, depending on how you pay your taxes. But we can avoid death. We can avoid the topic. We can push it aside. As a matter of fact, in uh, the training of morticians, uh, they, they coach them not to use the word death. And they're morticians. And so our culture has, uh, has gotten real good at avoiding this, uh, this very universal topic and that is that we all die if this is your first time here to cornerstone i'm sorry you showed up on this day but we're talking about death but we're also talking about the resurrection now ignoring the certainty of death doesn't help us it actually hurts us we're not dealing with the most uh sobering reality of all humankind and so, as long as death remains a problem for someone else, Jesus remains a Savior for someone else. In his book, Remembering Death, Matthew McCullough says, If we want to live with a resilient joy, a joy that's tethered not to the shifting circumstances, but to the rock-solid accomplishments of Jesus, we must look honestly at the problem of death. And so today, today we're going to look at that. We're going to look honestly at the universal problem with death. As I was reading this book and preparing for this message and uh, singing uh, an old uh, Ralph Stanley song yesterday as we're driving, my wife and I are driving in the car, and I'm, I'm singing all day long. I'm singing, Oh, death, oh, death. You know that song, right? Any Brother Warathal fans, right? Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm sure she got tired of it. We're walking through Kroger. I'm like, oh, Dad. <laughs> She's like, you, you stay behind me. But I, I turned to her. We're driving down the road. And I said, honey, if I died today before the end of this day, what would you do? And she listed off five things that she would do right away. Like she has prepared for this. <laughs> prepared for my death. <laughs> so... I need a wine taster like, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had the, uh, somebody to taste my food. And Anybody? Anybody? Any, okay, anyway. The point is that uh, uh, you need to ask yourself this question. Like, if, if this is the last day you're here on earth, what changes should you be making or need to make? Or maybe you've made them. Maybe you've thought very concretely about this. There are a number of people within our congregation that have lost loved ones to death recently. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic that uh, new, in, in recent months people have come to me and said, I, I'm struggling working through this, the death of my loved one. I'm struggling with this, you know. And so, so it's a topic that, uh, that we need to deal with head on. The Bible certainly does. Right off the bat, the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin is they bring death into the world. Thank you, Adam and Eve, for bringing that gift to all of us. If it wouldn't have been them, it would have been you, it would have been me, Right. 
And so uh, the Bible speaks to this topic very directly right off the bat. God tells Adam and Eve, uh, from dust you came and from dust you shall return. Uh, immediately following that, we have a murder. Cain kills Abel. And then in Genesis chapter 5, we have this recurring phrase. It appears 12 times in the chapter, and he died. And he died, 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 and he died. And we keep reading this over and over again. It's like, sin brings death. Don't miss this. Death comes to all men. Um, Ecclesiastes deals with this, this, this topic, and, and it, very, it starts off very cynical. It's this struggle. And so, so the Scriptures deal with that. But in our culture, we have managed to push the conversation of death off to the side. And there are a number of reasons for that. It used to be, I remember uh, one of the very first funerals I attended, I went to my be one of my best friend's house. And his father had passed away, and the funeral was in the front room, the front room of their house. And everybody came through and brought food. And, and it was kind of, I didn't think much of it back then, but like it, 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 to them it wasn't odd. How many, how many have been to a funeral in someone's home? Right, a couple of you, but not many. Because now we have funeral homes. And now we don't die at home, we die in the hospital, right? And so there, these are reasons why we've been able to push death aside in our ordinary, everyday conversations. We have hospital treatment plans and doctors who seem to present a, a treatment and a solution and a new drug and a new procedure for almost any ailment we have as if we can escape death. Uh, and so modern medicine has given this sense of entitlement that will live forever. Um, the caskets that we have today, right? They're pretty cool looking, right? You open one up and they're pretty comfy. It'd be a great place to take a nap. As long as you don't close the door on me, I'm good, right? Just leave it open. Uh, but the point is, like, you, you look at that and you're like, man, that's, that looks, that looks kind of nice. They're dressed up in their nice clothes and makeup on and all that. And so, uh, the word death has been pushed out of our language. Now, some might argue, well, no, it hasn't. We're, I see death all the time on television. There's CSI and The Walking Dead. But they've made death into an exotic experience. It's not ordinary. It doesn't come to a seven-year-old child. It doesn't come to a father that we like. It, it's, it's always somebody else. Death is somebody else. And so, I'm here to argue with you today that well, I'm not in an argument with you, <laughs> but I'm trying to convince us that how we face death shapes our whole life. So if you're not dealing with death and the certainty of it, you're not dealing with the whole of your life. You're not really bringing all of what Jesus promises into your existence. So ignoring the certainty of death doesn't protect us from our, the feelings of, uh, that we're going to have. It actually, it actually makes us more vulnerable to having those dark feelings and not being able to deal with them. The avoidance of holding, uh, of holding back this conversation also causes us to avoid and miss the, the very greatest blessings that Jesus brings into our lives. And so as long as death remains remote and unreal, Jesus' promises will too. That's why we have to grasp this conversation of death. So in light of this conversation, in light of what we're talking about right now, let me talk about the most important fact that we have to deal with this topic of death. And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anybody want to shout hallelujah right now? Anybody want to stand up and say amen right now? Woo! Yes, Jesus raised from the dead. And so if you've been reading the story, you know that Jesus talked about his death. And every time he talked about his up-and-coming death with his disciples, it crushed them. It angered them. They tried to stand in his way. But for Jesus, for him, his impending death brought focus to his real life. It made him count every day. In every word, in every action, he thought about what he was doing in a very concrete and real way because he knew his impending death was just around the corner. And so he lived in 30 year, 33 years more than most people would ever live because he, he knew his death was imminent and he knew he was dealing with that. 
And so he didn't push it aside. He talked about it. Talked about it with his friends. Talked about it after dinner. Talked about it while they walked. And so there's this, there's this important topic that Jesus brings up. Jesus knew he was going to die, and he died. Now, there's a popular theory that's been pushed in some Christian circles and other circles as well. It's called the swoon theory. It's that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just fainted from the, from the pain, and when he was put in the tomb, the coolness of the tomb made him awake, and he actually walked out. The famous preacher, J. Vernon McGee, once received a letter from a parishioner of another church, and uh, she said that her preacher on Easter talked about this swoon theory that Jesus didn't really die, and asked J. Vernon McGee, what do you think uh, about that? And he wrote her back, dear sister, beat your preacher 39 times with a heavy whip, nail him to a cross, hang him in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, and then put him in a airless tomb for three days and tell me what happens you get it right jesus died completely dead we got to start there right death comes to all of us hopefully not like that now jesus actually made numerous appearances alive and and there are historians that talk about this and uh, and, and so uh one time he was seen by over 500 witnesses. The day that Jesus was raised from the dead, that evening he appears to his apostles, and we read about this. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of Jewish, the Jewish leaders. They didn't believe in the resurrection that Jesus talked about. Suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And they were filled with joy and they saw the Lord. The disciples had to be convinced. And they had to see it with their own eyes before they believed Jesus died and was resurrected. They saw him perish on a cross, but they had not yet seen him resurrect. And so they saw this. Now, one of those disciples was missing, Thomas. He gets the label doubting Thomas. Really, he's believing Thomas, right? But, but he wouldn't be convinced until he saw the wounds for himself. Now, I just want to say to anyone here today that is a skeptic about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are welcome here. You do not have to believe like us to be here today. Uh, you don't have to think like uh, what you think a Christian might think about any kind of topic to be here today. If you're a skeptic or an unbeliever, you are welcome here today. But I am trying to convince you of this fact because I know in, the, in understanding the resurrection, it will help you deal with the most important conversation you will ever have, and that's your own death. And so, when Thomas comes to be convinced by Jesus. Jesus appears to him. Jesus says this very important statement. He says, You believe because you have seen me, talking about Thomas, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. There is a huge blessing that we have in life that we shouldn't miss by believing the concrete, factual resurrection of Jesus. And so there may be people who are here today or watching or listening and this is a big doubt in their mind. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, we're going to talk about some evidence to convince you of this because you're going to need this fact to deal with your own death. Now, the number one reason of unbelief uh, of skeptics in the world today is the resurrection. Like, it's just, they just cast it aside. And so, let me give you a little bit of historical evidence outside the Bible and outside people who were believers of Jesus historical evidence that talk about Jesus' resurrection. So here are a couple examples. Tacius, one of the Roman historians, uh, he says, Nero fastened the guilt, the guilt of burning of Rome, on a class of uh, hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, meaning Jesus Christ, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of the procreator Pontius Pilate. It was a known fact. Jesus lived and Jesus died on a cross. Roman historians who weren't believers in Jesus document this fact. 
But then Josephus, who's a Jew and a, an elite uh, part of the Roman Empire, he also says this. He writes about Jesus, not a believer. He says, about this time there lived Jesus a wise man, if indeed one thought to call him a man, for he wrought surprising feats, talking about his miracles. He was the Christ. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up on their affections for him. On the third day, he appeared restored to life. It's a fact. Everybody knows this. And the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. And so this prominent, non-Christian, Jewish-slash-Roman historian documents it for us outside of Scripture that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, it's important for us to understand that Pontius Pilate, his, his evidence in history shows us that there's a marker point where all of this took place. And, 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 and there's no doubt that Jesus lived and died. And the resurrection validates everything that he said. So when Jesus rose from the dead, it proves that all his statements were true because he said he would die and he said he would raise in three days and it happened. And so if he can rise from the dead, right? All, everything else he said was chump change. And some of the things, some of the com comments that he made, some of the statements he made about himself are a big deal. Like, he says, he and the Father are one. Jesus is the God-man. God put on flesh and bone and walked among us. It's a documented fact because of the resurrection. He's the only way to the Father. He says, I am the only way. I am the door. I am the only way to the Father. The only way you're going to enter into heaven, the only way is through Jesus Christ. No other religion. No other Messiah. Only Christ. And so, he, he, when he makes these statements, like he says, I come to bring abundant life. You cannot have abundant life outside a close walk with Jesus Christ. If you're not walking close with Jesus, you don't know what abundant life is. To live victoriously. To live full. To live with a purpose that goes beyond all understanding. I know many people aren't convinced of this. Marie and I uh, helped uh, Nick Kelvich move from Chatham to Charlottesville yesterday. And, and Nick, was, Nick was going through some like, loss of the Cornerstone family. And when we arrived, when we arrived there, as we began to unload, <coughs> a, a, a very polished woman from the apartment below came out and we greeted her. She's very nice. And then we get a text later on from Nick about how he's settling in. His hot water is not working, uh, and so some other things like that. But he began to have a conversation about Jesus with a lady that lived beneath him. He hasn't been there 24 hours. And he's, he's preaching the gospel to his new mission field called Charlottesville. And, and so, so she says to him, you're one of the most con uh, uh, convinced Christians that I've met recently. Like, she apparently had met other people that claimed to be Christians, but she saw something different in Nick and his words that made her convinced that he was convinced that Jesus was his Lord and raised from the dead. Like, but so here's what I'm saying. There's those large groups of people around the world that don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's our job to tell them, invite them, help them to understand that this is the most important fact that you need to have in your mind and heart because you're all, everyone, all of us are going to deal with death. And this is how we deal with it. And so we have this overwhelming evidence. In Lee Strobel's book, A Case for Christ, he cites this example of one who was not a very convinced believer of Jesus' resurrection. He was a very famous lawyer. His name was Lionel Luckhu. And he's in the Guinness Book of World Records because he's considered the most successful lawyer that ever lived. Uh, he had 275 uh, uh, murder acquittals in a row. Like, if, <laughs> he always won. Isn't that amazing? So he was challenged by some Christian friends to examine the evidence of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so uh, he came to this conclusion... He said, uh, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming 
that it, it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. It takes more faith to be an atheist than to be a Christian because a Christian is believing in the facts that surround the event. And, and so we have, we have this huge body of evidence that proves that Jesus died, buried, and was resurrected. Now, some might say, well, Jesus' body was stolen. That doesn't make any sense. If the Sanhedrin stole it, when the apostles got up to preach on the day of Pentecost, they would have produced the body, and that would have shut them up. The, the, we've already established that the disciples, they were too scared. They didn't even believe in the resurrection until Jesus appeared to them. That, so it, it doesn't make sense for them to steal it. So, some might say, well, the Romans conspired in this and they have the body. Well, that doesn't make sense. The people who were high up in the echelon of the Roman Empire would have known about this fabrication, this story. And some of those become very devout followers of Jesus Christ. So the only logical explanation is this man died and walked out of the tomb. And that's a big deal. For decades, skeptics have, 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 just not, have, have disregarded the prophecies about this event. All the prophecies that talk about this. And they say, well, the prophecies about Jesus' resurrection were inserted in the Bible. They were put in later on after Jesus died and lived. I mean, after Jesus' life. But all the skeptics' arguments were blown to smithereens in 1948 by a little shepherd boy just south of the Dead Sea who was throwing rocks because kids like to throw rocks. He threw rocks in caves, and he threw one into a cave, and he heard some pottery break. When he went back in there to investigate, he found these scrolls, scrolls of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, these scrolls of Isaiah and other books of the Bible. And they were over 400 years old. And do you know what they contained? The prophecies about Jesus. That he would be born of a virgin. That he would be born in Bethlehem. That he would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. All of those prophecies were in those scrolls. So, so we know the Bible talked about this happening. It did happen. And we have all this huge body of evidence to prove that it did happen. But perhaps... The greatest evidence of all of Jesus' resurrection is the apostles' life and death themselves. Peter was crucified upside down and Paul was beheaded in Rome. Andrew preached to Asia uh, and, and was crucified. Thomas preached to India and was pierced with spears. Matthew preached to uh, Persia, Ethiopia, and was stabbed to death. Bartholomew preached to India uh, <clears throat> Armenia and Arabia, he died there. James preached to Syria and was stoned to death. Simon preached to Persia and was killed for refusing uh, to worship idols. Matthias preached to Syria and was burned to death. And John survived being boiled in oil and was exiled to Patmos. They said when they threw John into this big vat of boiling oil, he began to swim around. <laughs> and they said, we can't kill this guy. Let's put him on an island. Maybe that'll shut him up. An angel came to him and said, let me tell you what's going on in heaven right now. Write this down. And then he wrote that down, and we call that letter Revelation. And it was distributed to all the churches in Asia and gave them courage because the message of Revelation is we win. There's only one winning team. It's called the Church of Christ. That's it. I'm not talking about the denomination. I'm talking about the church. There's only one team that wins. It's church. You better be on the team, right? You want to get on this team. I expect every non-believer to be down at invitation time, right? Baptistry is warm. All right. I'm excited. I'm preaching better than you're listening. Are you paying attention? Come on. Let's go. What powered the apostles' preaching was time spent with Jesus. And what prepared them for death was seeing Jesus resurrected. Over 500 witnesses of the resurrected Christ. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. You will be my eyewitnesses to the world. You will proclaim that I resurrected from the dead. <clears throat> the apostles, when they were going about preaching Jesus and establishing the church throughout the empire, they did not have a tract that says Jesus. They did not have a New Testament. What they had was an event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
and how the church was established was not with a bunch of writings, but was with testimony from eyewitnesses that Jesus rose from the dead. That's how the church got started. That's how the church moves forward. This is our message. And you and I, this is, it's so important for us because this is how we're going to deal with death. This is how we're going to handle it. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, meaning Adam, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, meaning Jesus. Just as everyone dies because we belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Paul uses an agricultural term here, great harvest. I'm not a farmer, but I hang out with them. And they plant this thing called winter wheat. I didn't even know there was a winter wheat. But they know when they see those sprouts coming up and they look healthy, they know there's going to be a great harvest. Jesus came up out of the ground. There will be a great harvest. The trumpet of God will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And the rest of us will meet him in the air. That is more certain than you having lunch today. That's a certain fact. Some of you are like, oh, he's talking about lunch. Now I'm hungry. Well, let me, I'm going to feed you some more spiritual food, right? So one very practical reason you must believe in the resurrection is to prepare yourself for your own death. And so the best way to enjoy life is to get honest about your death. If you numb yourselves to this conversation, you numb yourselves to the presence of Jesus in your life. You've got to talk about it. You've got to deal with it. And so the value of Jesus is relevant, relative to, 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 to what we talk about, this big thing that he saves us from, death. Now I'm going to give you a four-word statement. It's one of those, aren't you glad you came statements? Because you're thinking, this is the worst day to bring your friend. But it's actually not. But here's the statement. Are you ready? Everybody loses everything to death. There it is. It's the great equalizer. I don't care how rich you are or how famous you are or how popular you are. I know you're going to die just like me. And we're not going to take a, anything with us. There's never a U-Haul at a funeral, right? Because nobody's taking anything anywhere. And so, you have to deal with this topic. You have to. You can't escape it. Some people deal with this topic by just hedonism or, or grabbing all the gusto in life. And so, they, they know they're going to die. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we may die. You know, it's that kind of life. And, and so, we're just going to grab everything we can. We're not, we're not going to talk about death. We're just going to party. But eventually, the party ends. Eventually, the sun sets. Eventually, the keg runs dry. Eventually, you know, whatever it is, eventually there comes an end to that. And at some point in time, that person will begin to become a cynic. And they will begin to say to themselves, why go on? Why live? Because it's all going to end anyway. And that's where a lot of people end up. Suicide is fast-growing reason of death in the United States. Some people deal with death with uh, uh, stoic detachment. Just not going to talk about it. Not going to deal with it. This is all an illusion. Some people try to create an alternate reality in games, video experiences, or whatever type of experiences. Just escapism. Just try to escape all of that. Some people are just very cynical. Like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, right? Remember Eeyore? Some of you are like, no, we got to watch Winnie the Pooh, right? A lot about life in Winnie the Pooh. And uh, Eeyore was this guy like, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. You know, that was Eeyore. Well, you don't want to hang out with that person. You don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that has the remedy in your heart, which is Jesus Christ. So how can you enjoy life without knowing about your death and resurrection in a very concrete way? 
You should enjoy life. Jesus' first miracle, where he created all the wine at the, at the wedding at Canaan, he was talking about enjoying life. Hey, the Messiah is here. It's time to party. It's time to be full of joy. Wine is a symbol of joy throughout Scripture. And he created a lot of joy. And so it has nothing to do with alcohol. It has everything to do with that. Jesus brings joy. Enjoy life. Enjoy your family. Enjoy a good Mexican meal at the right Mexican restaurant in town and not that dark side. And enjoy. <laughs> Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, and that's okay. Uh, so bad. Uh, and, and enjoy a vacation. Enjoy the sunset at the beach. Enjoy the mountains. Enjoy holding your. Enjoy those things. But know this because of death, they're all passing. That's okay. Because they're all a foretaste of what Jesus is preparing for those who live by faith in Him. That's why you should enjoy it. And you should enjoy life. Celebrate life. Enjoy each other's company. Don't be Eeyore. Right? So anyway, this is when we really start to enjoy life. When we have things in perspective. When we know death is coming and we know this will be a loss, but there will be a gain in Christ that's, that's unfathomable. I, I just think about that, that, that illustration. I love it. C.S. Lewis says, Most people live life playing in the mud hole when just over the, just over the sand bank there's an ocean. And they don't understand. But for Christians, we're playing in the mud hole sometimes, but we know there's an ocean on the other side. We can't wait to see it, right? We know. So prepare for this. Oftentimes when I go home in the evening, I go by the Chatham Firehouse and there's people just getting ready for, you know, rescue squad, getting training. Usually like 50 cars. And all of these people, thank God for them and their preparation, are preparing for the next uh, accident on, the, on 29 or the, or the next rescue from someone who's dying of a heart attack at a house. Like they're, they're going through the procedures. They're getting trained for the next uh, uh, moment where they have to be on the scene giving the very best care to save lives. I pray that we as a church would be just as diligent about preparing for our own death, that we would invest this much time and this much energy in being prepared to meet death, because it's coming. Death declares that there is a consequence to sin and a judgment upon evil. I'm glad death is coming. To be honest with you, I wish death would come to some people that are bringing evil and injustice on others right now. Like, I, I, I wish God would just take them out. I'll just be honest with you. I hear stories of injustice brought upon children, of injustice brought upon groups of people. Frank and Myra Reynolds are here. They are missionaries to Rwanda, training... You hear about the genocide in Rwanda that took place. You hear about all that death, all that needless death. Things like that happen all over the world, happening right now. Christians being... Be I wish God would end it all right now. I wish He would take out those people. And then Jesus says, pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Hey, Jesus, why don't you give us something hard to do? You know? I mean, that's immensely hard. But know this... There is a judgment day coming. There is going to be a consequence to every sin. And for those who are wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith, they will intercept God's grace. And for those who aren't wearing the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith, they will intercept God's wrath. And your worst plan of destroying someone that you don't like doesn't even come close to the judgment that will fall on the unrighteous at judgment day. Death declares that there is a judgment to come. And so death tells us everyone, death tells everyone, we are not too important to die. The gospel tells everyone especially us, we're so important that Christ died for us. Death strips away all the illusions that people have about how they're going to cope with the afterlife or how they're going to cope with problems. It strips, it makes, it's an equalizer. 
You can't view life on your own terms because of death. The only way you can deal with life and deal with death is on God's terms. That's the only way. It's the only way to survive. And so remembering death guides us to our living hope, Jesus and his resurrection. At the funeral yesterday morning, the coffin was right before me. Like I was sitting right in front of it or behind it. And I could see the family over here. Where was the sting of death? Right there. They're weeping because they've lost a loved one. And we will cry too as we lose our loved ones. But they knew that that was not the end. They took the casket out of the church and then they went and planted it in the ground. We don't bury Christians. We just plant them. Because they're all coming back up. Yes, they are. You don't want to be the guy or the girl that doesn't know Jesus. There's dead people coming up out of the ground and you're not going up. You want to know Christ. You want to know you're going up. We caught up, right? And so death stings really bad. But there is a solution. Jesus and his resurrection. So let me close, since it's been uncomfortable for the last 35 minutes, let me close with one more uncomfortable question. Have you dealt with your death? I'm going to be standing up here, and I'd love to continue to help you work through that. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ will help you deal with that. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the web at cornerstonechatham.org.